This is Greek with David Hutchison. Nouns. Second declension. Let's learn some new endings. These are noun endings for the second declension. We're going to start in the masculine column. Os, u, o, on. Oi, on, ois, us. Os, u, o, on. Oi, on, ois, us. Remember to say these with me. Let's do it again. Os, u, o, on. Oi, on, ois, us. Now the neuter endings. On, u, o, on. A, on, ois, a. On, u, o, on. A, on, ois, a. These are the endings for the second declension. Where do you think you're going to put endings? You will put them at the end. So we're talking about nouns. A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. David studies. David would be a noun. It's a person. We live in the city. City would be an example of a place. We throw a ball. That would be a thing. Humility is key. Humility would be a noun. It would be an idea. So think back to when you did verbs. You did the present active indicative. You put your verb endings at the end of the verb stem. And that's how you made the, the verb change. So we had luo, luace, lue, luomen, luete, luusi. All we did was we had the verb stem lu. This was the present stem. Then we added the endings oase, amen, eti, usi. And that's how we made the verb change and say different things. We also added a sigma in the middle to be a sign of the future tense. So remember this, we had luso, luces, luce, lusamen, lucete, lususi. So that sigma was a key of the future tense, and then you had endings. Well, when we are going to be putting noun endings at the end of a noun stem, it's very similar to when we put verb endings at the end of a verb stem. So this is what we're doing, noun endings at the end of a noun stem. So you take these endings, the masculine endings, os, u, o, on, oi, on, ois, us, and we would put them at the end of a masculine noun of the second declension. Or if you had a neuter noun of the second declension, you take the neuter endings, on, u, o, on, a, on, ois, a, and put them at the end of that noun. So it looks like this. Let's say we have the word logos, which means word. Here's the noun stem, log. Then we're going to add our endings, os, u, o, on, oi, on, ois, us. You put the endings at the end of the noun stem, and then that's how you make the chart. Logos, logu, logo, logon, logoi, logon, logois, Lagus. So you put your noun endings at the end of the noun stem. And it's going to change from nominative to genitive to dative to accusative. And you can do that in the singular or the plural. Now if we had a neuter noun, such as doron, the word that means gift, you have the noun stem, door, and then you add the neuter endings, on, u, o, on, a, on, ois, a. So you put those at the end, and then you have this. Doron, doru, doro, doron, dora, doron, dorois, dora. On, u, o, on, a, on, ois, a. When we had a masculine noun, we used masculine endings. When we have a neuter noun, we use neuter endings. Now, how do you translate these? Well, the translation of a noun will depend on what it's doing in the sentence. You could say it depends on the noun function. And how do you know what the noun function is? It's determined by the noun's case. So noun function is determined by the noun case. And how do you know what the case is? Well, you simply look at the endings. By looking at the endings, you know what the case is.
So let's look at these cases. Here's a nominative. Most of the time when you have a nominative, it's going to be the subject of a verb. This is a very typical usage. So in the sentence, the boy hits the ball. The boy is the subject. It's doing the action of the verb hits. So the boy hits the ball. Boy is the subject. The dog ate the bone. Dog is the subject. The Cowboys scored a touchdown. Let it be. Let it be. The Cowboys would be the subject. Now let's see an example in Greek. Apostolos lege. The word apostolos is nominative because it has nominative endings. This is nominative, masculine, singular. So it would be the subject of the verb lege. So an apostle speaks. Another example, ha theos akue. Ha theos is a nominative subject. The word ha is an article. We'll talk about that later. Ha theos is nominative. It's the subject of the verb akue. So God is the subject of the verb hears. Another pretty typical use of the nominative is called a predicate nominative. The first thing I would try is a subject, but a predicate nominative is also very common. A predicate nominative completes a being verb, such as I am a Christian. The word am is the being verb, and a Christian is a noun that's completing the being verb am. I am a Christian. Christian would be a predicate nominative. You are sons. Sons would be a predicate nominative. A me apostolos. I am an apostle. Here, apostolos is nominative. It's the predicate nominative of the being verb, a me. So we would call this one a predicate nominative. Now, when you have a predicate nominative, you can have the being verb that appears in the text. You can also, in Greek, say the same thing without the being verb. So sometimes the being verb won't even be in the text. It's simply implied. So if you ever have a clause or a sentence with no verb, chances are what you have is an assumed being verb. If that's the case, you're probably going to have a predicate nominative. It's also possible that you could have a predicate adjective. A predicate adjective we'll talk about later, but basically that's just an adjective that does the same type of thing. So instead of I am an apostle, apostle is a noun, you could say I am tall where tall is an adjective, a descriptive word, and it would be a predicate adjective. So nominative, can you think back to what two main uses of nominative were? Nominative subject, nominative predicate nominative. Okay, subject, predicate nominative. Now genitive, genitive is going to show possession or description. And you can put a keyword for genitive, of. Anytime you see a genitive at this point, let's simply put the word of in front of the noun. This is David's book, or in other words, this is the book of David. This would be an example of possession. The Son of God saves sinners. Of God would be genitive, and we could call this description. Here is that same phrase from the biblical text, ha to tu theu, the Son Huios means son. Again, that word in front of it, ha, is an article, the word the. Then tu theu, that's another article, tu, in front of the noun theu, which is genitive. So of God, the son of God, that would be genitive. We'd call that genitive. When you have a genitive, it's modifying some other noun, and we're going to call that noun the head noun. So in this example, the, the genitive noun theu modifies huios. So huios would be the head noun, and theu modifies huios. When you translate a genitive, you can grab it together with the noun that it modifies. If you want, write a little circle around it, put parentheses around it, translate it all together. You can do it at the same time if you like. With the genitive, other nuances are possible, but you don't need to worry about that today. Each day has enough worries of its own. Somebody pretty smart said that once upon a time. So we have nominative, genitive, then dative. Dative 
is going to be an indirect object. It might show location or it might show means. So here are some keywords for dative. You can try to plug all of these in when you see a dative and see which one best fits the context. To, for, in, or by. For example, she gave me a kiss. In English, you might say she gave me or she gave to me, but this would be an example of an indirect object. She gave to me a kiss. This example is for you. He is where? In the house. That idea can be expressed in Greek simply by the dative. He scored a 100. How? By means of his hard work. Hint, hint, hint. How do you score 100? By means of hard work. Dative can express this means idea, by means of. So just with the dative, it could be by means of so-and-so. Here's a Greek example, grapho apostolois, grapho apostolois. I am writing to apostles. What do you think? Is this one indirect object? Is it the two or four idea? Is it location or is it means? Well, with this translation, it's indirect object. To whom are you writing? I am writing to apostles. That same sentence could say, I am writing by means of apostles, simply with the dative. And so if we translated it that way, then we would say that it's a dative of means. I am writing by means of apostles. Now the accusative case, the accusative is very often going to be the direct object. This is the object of a verb. So for example, kids run races. Kids is the subject, run is the verb. The object of that verb is races. The zoo has animals. Animals would be the object of the verb has. Do you have a car? This one's in the form of a question, but still the verb have is the verb and car is the object. You have car? Question mark. Graphes lagus. You are writing, that's graphes, lagus. You are writing lagus. You are writing words. This would be accusative plural, so it's going to be the direct object. What are you writing? You are writing words. There's another case called vocative. This one comes from the Latin word vocare, to call. This is the case we would say of direct address. David, please give me that book. The word David would be vocative. Jesus says to one woman in the Gospels, do you remember who? Woman, what concern is that to me? Here's an example of a vocative from Romans 2. Anapologetos, a, o, anthrope. The first word you haven't had yet, so it's not going to make any sense. But the second word, a, is the verb you are. And then the word o is simply the word o. And anthrope, here's our, here's our vocative. We didn't do the vocative ending. I'm not going to make you memorize it because it's not that frequent. But it's in this form. It's simply the epsilon at the end. So you are without excuse, O anthrope. You are without excuse, O man. So this would be a vocative of direct address. When you're addressing someone, you can put it in the vocative. So these are the basic uses of the cases. Let's think back. Nominative. Nominative was subject or predicate nominative. Genitive showed possession, description, Keyword for genitive was of. Dative, indirect object, location, or means. Keywords to, for, in, by, even with. Accusative, primary use there is going to be direct object. And then vocative is our case for direct address. In English, word order is extremely important. It's not as important in Greek. We won't say it means nothing, but it definitely doesn't mean everything. So in English, you determine the function of a word by its order in a sentence. So if I said, David eats apples, 
then David is the subject because it precedes the verb eats, and apples is the object. If I said apples eat David, then I'm saying something completely different, and I'm doing that based on word order. Basically, you can think of English as a left-to-right, subject-verb-object type of language, except when you're doing poetry or when you're listening to Star Wars. So word order, very important in English. Word order, not so important in Greek. What is so important in Greek is case. So the function of a word is determined by its case. Well, how do I know what the case is? Look at the endings. Look at those noun endings and you can figure out what the case is. So focus on word endings, not on word order. Let's look back at this chart. I want you to see something. So for the masculine, we had os, u, o, on, oi, on, ois, us. And then for the neuter, we had on, u, o, on, a, on, ois, a. So if you look there in the middle, you see the genitive, the genitive and the dative. The forms are the same for masculine or neuter. This is a nice thing because when you see u, you know it's genitive singular. When you see O, you're thinking dative singular. When you see own, you're thinking genitive plural. And when you see ois, you're thinking dative plural. Now, by the way, look at that iota subscripting in the dative form, and look at that iota in the plural of the dative. These are signals of dative. So if you ever see an iota, ask yourself, is this a dative? It's not always the case because look at the very top of the chart on masculine plural. Nominative masculine plural is oi. Now another thing to notice, the nominative neuter singular is the same as the accusative neuter singular. This is nice when you're filling out a chart because if you can remember on as the nominative neuter singular form, then you can very easily go down to accusative neuter singular and put on right there. So you already know two forms if you know one. Same thing in the plural. You have the a, ah, the alpha, in nominative neuter plural, as well as accusative neuter plural. So this can be a very nice thing. It may occur to you, well, if I see the same form, how do I know if it's nominative or accusative if it's a neuter word? How do I know? Well, what you're going to do is become a Greek detective, and you don't just pay attention to one clue, you pay attention to multiple clues. So the one clue was the word endings, but some cases you have to solve by looking at multiple clues. So look at other words. What are their endings? If you've got something else that has to be nominative, then chances are this word is accusative. And then, of course, do things even make sense? Would a certain word make sense as a subject, or would it even make sense as an object? So let's look at those other words for help. Here's a bit of good news for you. We're talking about declensions, and in particular, we're talking today about the second declension. The good news is that the function of a noun is going to be the same regardless of which declension we're studying. Words are only going to be in one declension, but once you've learned what a nominative does in the second declension, a nominative in the first declension does the exact same thing, and a nominative in the third declension does the exact same thing. So endings, patterns of endings may be different, that's fine, but the meaning of a nominative is going to be the meaning of a nominative regardless of declension. Now why are we doing second declension nouns first? Two reasons. Number one, it's a little bit easier. Number two, they're very common. Nouns have gender. It's important to realize that when we're talking about grammatical gender, we're not talking about natural gender. Nouns have grammatical gender, not natural gender. In other words, a noun that is masculine does not necessarily have masculine qualities. And a noun that's feminine is not necessarily going to have feminine qualities, and something that's neuter is not going to have whatever you would call neuter qualities. So this is a grammatical category. It's not a natural category. So the word 
hamartolos is masculine. This is the word that means sinner. So perhaps the, the women in the class can have a field day with all of us men saying, Ha! You are a hamartolos. That's masculine. You're a sinner. Makes sense to me. Well, then the men in the class might say, Well, the word hamartia is feminine, and hamartia means sin. So obviously, sin is a feminine sort of thing. Well, you can see that these are related words, and so it just doesn't work that way. So something that's masculine doesn't mean it's associated with males, and something that's feminine doesn't mean it's associated with females. Now, you will sometimes have things that make sense, like a huios, is a son is going to be masculine, and so forth, but just don't, don't assume any sort of natural equation with the gender of a word. Here's a good translation strategy at this point in your Greek career. Let me just say, don't simply read left to right and just put words down in that order and think that the meaning is whatever the left to right meaning is. This is going to be a tendency and a temptation. You have to fight it at this point in your career. Now, I want you to observe the word order. I don't want you simply to put the words in that order and think that you've made an English sentence because English is not Greek. So number one, find a verb. Go ahead and translate the verb. Number two, find a nominative subject. How do I know if it's a nominative subject? Look for a word with nominative endings and see if it could be the subject of that verb. If you have a nominative subject, you're not going to need the pronoun in the verb, such as he writes, you, and then you have paulos. You don't need to say Paul, he writes. You would simply say Paul writes. Number one, find a verb. Number two, find a nominative subject. Number three, find an accusative direct object or a predicate nominative. Number four, then you can look at the rest of the sentence. When you do this, you've got verb, you've got subject, you've got object. You have the basic structure of a sentence. You have the bare bones of a sentence. And if we wanted to put it into a visual diagram, it would look something like this. In English, subject, verb, object. You see the word palos, it would be the subject. Graphe, that's the verb. Lagus, the object. This is, a, this is a diagram. I'm not going to make you diagram right now, although it's actually quite helpful. A Greek sentence is not necessarily going to appear in this order. But if you want to diagram it, if you want to put the verb in that verb slot, and you want to put the subject in that subject slot, and you want to put the object in that object slot, you'll have the basic structure of a sentence. And by the way, this is a great way to outline a Bible study or a sermon when you find out what the Greek text is actually doing. This is one excellent way to do it. So what are we going to do? We're going to find a verb. Then we're going to find a nominative subject. Then we're going to find an accusative direct object or a predicate nominative. And then we're going to move on and do the rest of the sentence. Let's try this strategy on some example sentences. So here we have graphe, doulos, nomon. The first thing we want to do is find a verb. Here's our verb. I'm going to write V for verb. How do I know it's a verb? It has those verb endings. A. O ace A amen eti usi. There's our verb. I'm going to look for now a nominative subject. Here we have doulos. The os. This is going to be our nominative subject. It has nominative endings. Then I'm going to find an object. Namon, on. So here in Greek order, we have verb, subject, object. But we're translating into English. So when we put it into English, we put it into English word order. And English word order is S V O, subject, verb, object. So our verb is graphe. By itself, it would mean he writes. I'll put the he in parentheses because if I have a nominative subject, I don't need it. 
and it turns out I do have a nominative subject, which is doulos, servant. A servant. I'm going to scratch out the word he. A servant writes, and then nomon is our accusative direct object. A servant writes. A servant writes a law. You could also translate the word doulos as a slave. You, can, you could also translate instead of rights, you could say is writing. So a servant or a slave is writing a law. Now if we just put this into word order, regular word order, Greek word order, he writes servant a law. You would jumble up the entire meaning of the whole sentence. So let's follow this strategy. Find a verb, find a nominative subject, Find an accusative direct object or a predicate nominative, then do the rest of the sentence. So what if we changed that order? Doulos, graphe, namon. Now this is an order that looks right in English. It wouldn't really change anything though because the endings stay the same. So here we have os, that's a nominative, it's going to be the subject. Here's our verb. And then here is our accusative object. So you can change the word order, but what we're going to pay attention to is not the word order so much as it is the endings. This one does, in fact, have the same meaning because of the same case endings. Let's try this one. Gnoskite thanaton. Gnoskite thanaton. I hope this one is actually not true for you for a number of years. Number one, find a verb. How do you know it's a verb? Well, it has verb endings. So the word genoskete is our verb, has verb endings, has ete. This is you, plural, no, you, plural, no. Uh, now, number two, subject. Well, we don't have a subject. And you're not really going to expect a subject when you have a, a you type of verb. Second singular, second plural, you're not going to expect a different subject. You are going to expect a different subject when you have third singular, third plural. So if there's no subject, you just go to the next step. Do we have an accusative direct object? Well, thanaton is accusative, so this will be our object, and it means death. So you can see why I say I hope you don't know this anytime soon. You know death. Let's try another one. Luusen Adelfoy Dulus. Luusen Adelfoy Dulus. Let's find a verb. Here Luusen is a verb. It has verb endings. Adelfoy. This is going to be our subject. The reason I know that is because of the oi ending. This is a nominative masculine plural ending. Us is accusative. It's going to be our object. So the verb by itself would mean they loose. But very quickly, if you see that you have both a subject and a verb, you can go ahead and grab the subject and the verb at the same time. So I could simply say brothers loose. Brothers loose. And then our object is do loose. This is accusative plural. Brothers loose servants or slaves. Try it again. What's the order that we do? First a verb, then a nominative subject, then an accusative direct object. So ferusin is a verb. I know it because it has verb endings. Huioi. This is nominative. Dora. That one could be nominative or it could be accusative. It's either nominative or accusative. So we've got some detective work to do on this sentence. So first of all, we've got the verb by itself. It means they bring.
then I've either got as a nominative subject, I've either got huioi, which means sons, or I've got dora, which means gifts. I know that huioi has to be nominative. So if dora could be either nominative or accusative, then this is going to lead me to think that huioi is going to be our subject. So sons bring, and then Dora, sons bring gifts. Now another part of context is, does that make sense? Does that make sense in English? Do sons bring gifts? Well, that can make sense in English. There's another reason why the opposite could not be true. And I'll mention it now, but I'll talk about it again in a moment. A neuter plural subject, Dora could be neuter plural subject, but a neuter plural subject has to take a third singular verb, and our verb is not third singular. So there's another reason why that one couldn't work. Let's talk about that one again in a minute. Another example, graphes, lagus, apostolos. Graphes, lagus, apostolos. So number one, find a verb. Which of these has verb endings? That's graphes, the ace ending. By itself, it means you write. Number two, let's try to find a nominative subject. But wait a second. I told you a moment ago that when you have a second person verb, a U verb, you're not usually going to have a nominative subject. Let's just check just in case. Lagus, no, that's not nominative. Apostolos, no, that's not nominative either. So we don't have a specific subject except the one that's in the verb. U right, then we have Lagus. This one is an accusative, so we'll call it the direct object. U right words. And then apostolos, here we have this ois ending. This is dative plural. The dative is going to be to, for, in, by, or with. And apostolos is apostles. You write words to, for, in, by, or with apostles. You write words to apostles. Does that make sense? Yeah, that one is possible. How about for apostles? You write words for apostles. Yes, that could work. In apostles. Not likely. You could say something like that. The word is written in our heart. And so in that kind of a sense, eh, but not very likely. You write words by apostles. Eh, that could even work. You write words with apostles. So on this one, you actually have a lot of things that could work. Any translation that's a legitimate option, you can count as correct. Now let's look at this longer sentence. Akue tekna lagus oiko al akuusen akloi lagus eremo. Long sentences are scary. Let's, let's have some help, though. First of all, when I see that comma right in the middle, if you see punctuation marks, one thing you can do, go ahead and break up the sentence into a couple of different parts. This is going to help us mentally and just visually too. So let's do this. So I break it at the comma. Now all of a sudden, this is not quite as scary. Still scary, but not quite as scary. So let's just do everything before the comma first, and then we'll do everything after the comma. So number one, find a verb, a kue. It's a verb, has verb endings. By itself, it would mean he writes. It's third singular. Let's find a nominative subject, tekna. This is nominative or accusative. It's going to be neuter and plural. So it's either nominative, neuter, plural, or accusative neuter plural. How do I know that? Well, I'm either looking at the chart or I already have the endings memorized. 
So that one could be nominative, it could be accusative. Let's look what else we have. Log oos, so this oos, this has to be accusative. So it's going to be our object. And then oiko, that's dative. We think that tekna is going to be the subject of this verb. But why is it neuter plural when this verb, akue, is third singular? Again, here's this goofy rule in Greek. Neuter plural subjects take a third singular verb. Neuter plural subjects take a third singular verb. So a technon is a child, plural, this would be children here. Children here. Then our accusative direct object is logus. Children hear words. Oiko. This is dative, to, for, in, by, or with. Children hear words, to, for, in, by, or with a house. Which of those makes sense? Probably in makes the most sense. Children hear words in a house. I don't really have to decide at this point, so I could write two, four, in, by, or with a house and see what the rest of the sentence says. Then we have this word, but. This is a conjunction. We'll talk about conjunctions in a moment, but I'm just going to tell you now it's the conjunction that means but. It expresses a strong contrast. But, then the rest of this, let's just do our same strategy. Find a verb, find a subject, find an object. So here's a verb, a kuusin. Verb, subject, object. How do I know this is a verb? It has verb endings. And I remember studying this verb when I memorized the vocab form. So a kuusin is a verb. Akoi is a subject because it's nominative. Lagus is an object because it's accusative. And then eremo, this is dative just like oiko. So our verb is a kuusin, they, here. Do we have a subject? We do, it's akoi. Crowds, here. Crowds, here, lagus, accusative object. Crowds, here, words. Then eremo, in a desert. Children hear words in a house, but crowds hear words in a desert. So that's a long sentence, but if we break it up into component parts, it helps out a lot. And if we follow that simple strategy, find a verb, find a subject, find an object, it really helps a lot. Now, something we've alluded to already several times, but let's make it explicit, is what we can call subject-verb agreement. A subject and a verb will normally agree. And really, you could even change the word normally to almost always. There are a few exceptions. But what does that mean? That means that if you have a singular subject, it's going to take a singular verb. If you have a plural subject, it's going to take a plural verb. So that just makes good common sense. A singular subject goes with a singular verb. A plural subject goes with a plural verb. So here's this weird rule. This is the type of thing that you're going to see five or ten times, and it's going to look weird every time. And you're going to say, what's that? Why is this doing such and such? Oh, yeah, it's that crazy rule. And it's going to take you 10 or 20 minutes to get to the point where you say, oh, it's that crazy rule. Well, here's the rule. Neuter plural subjects take a third singular verb. Neuter plural subjects take a third singular verb. So if you're paying attention, which of course is a good idea in Greek, if you're paying attention and you see a neuter plural subject, you may expect to see a plural verb, but remember, a neuter plural subject takes a third singular verb. Don't feel bad when you forget this rule five or ten times. This is the type of thing that just takes a long time to get. Now, you're already familiar with the word parsing. We talked about it before. 
when we were parsing verbs, and that just means identifying the elements of a verb, remember we did tense, voice, mood, person, number, lexical form, lexical meaning. When we do nouns, we do case, gender, number, lexical form, lexical meaning. Do you notice that those last two things are the same? They're always going to be the same, by the way, when you parse. The last two things are always lexical form, lexical meaning. Case, gender, number, lexical form, lexical meaning. Well, what could the case options be? Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative. One of those five. And we're almost never going to see vocative, so basically you've got four options. That's the case. Gender is either masculine or feminine or neuter. Now, think back. Do Greek nouns have natural gender or grammatical gender? They have grammatical gender. Number is either singular or plural. You've seen that before, singular or plural. Lexical form, that simply means the form you look up in a lexicon. And for a noun, it's going to be the nominative singular form. And then lexical meaning, that's simply the meaning of the lexical form. What is the dictionary lexicon? What is the lexical definition? Remember, this is not the meaning of the inflected form, not the meaning in context. So remember, all you're doing when you get to this is giving me the basic dictionary definition. So most of the time of this video, we've been talking about nouns, but I also want to talk about conjunctions for just a moment. Conjunctions are words that join things together. They join together words or phrases, clauses, or sentences. Here are a few different examples of conjunctions. The word Allah is a conjunction that means but. This is a, this is a strong contrast type of conjunction. One thing, Allah, another. One thing, but, another. So we're going to express a strong contrast. De. De, you can translate either as now or but or sometime even untranslated. This one is not as strong of a contrast as Allah. Kai, you've already seen this before, but this is the conjunction that means and. It can also mean even, but let's start with and, then you go for even. If you had Kai, 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 then a bunch of words, and then another Kai, it's going to be both and, both apples and bananas. So you might have Kai apples, Kai bananas. Both apples and bananas. Kai cowboys, Kai redskins. Both cowboys and redskins. Now I want to give you a brief introduction to someone who will become a very good friend in Greek. This is the article. We're not going to learn it today except for a little bit. Next week you'll actually meet the full article in all of its glory. But Today, what I want to tell you is that in Greek, there is no such thing as an indefinite article. What does that mean? Well, an indefinite article is the word a or an. In Greek, there's no such thing. So how do, you, how do you get the word a or an? Well, you don't have the article is one way. The article is the word the. The article is kind of like a pointer finger. Mom says it's not polite to point. But the article is pointing out. It's a pointing type of thing. So the article is the word the. Here we have angelos, comma, ha. The, the article ha is a masculine article. Hados, comma, he. The word he is the feminine article. Doron, comma, ta. Ta is the neuter article. So in your vocab list, if you see something comma ha, then you automatically know it's masculine. If you saw something comma he, you know automatically it's feminine. And if you see something comma ta, you know that it's neuter. So you may see vocab lists that look like this. When you look up a lexical entry in a lexicon, you're probably going to see something like this. It's a little bit longer. 
angelos, comma, u, comma, ha, comma, angel. What this would mean whenever you see this is angelos. That's the nominative singular form. U is the genitive singular form, angelos, angelu. And then you have ha, the article, and then you have the definition. Why would they give you the genitive singular form? It's because if you know the nominative form and you know the genitive form, you can know the pattern. So the lexicons will do this such a thing. I put it with the dash in front of U. The lexicons may or may not put that dash. It may simply say angelos, U, ha, angel. Let me remind you once again to watch this video multiple times. Save it to your computer. Listen to the audio only file when you're driving around. And these things will make sense, more sense, on multiple exposures. So this is your introduction to the noun, nouns of the second declension, a little bit on conjunctions, and a little bit on the article. Press on. You can do it.